Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure again to be here with you and among such a brave and courageous people. You are doing very important work. What I want to talk about is more generic and not a particular think tank, but thinking strategically in business planning and producing our work. Uh, to think strategically has a unique characteristic. It's not just planning. It means understanding that you're involved with other people who can anticipate your move. We know as we speak today, there are socialists, there are nationalists, there are fascists, there are religious extremists, there are modest social democrats, there are many different forces out there. They're in their meetings also discussing these things. We have to think strategically about them, but also, I'll talk about this, about our customers. One of the things I want to talk about is thinking like a business and thinking strategically in that sense. So before that, though, I want to ask what I call the Stoic question. Uh, Stoicism is very important to me personally. My father was uh, something of a Stoic, and when I was a small boy, he gave to me Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius, and it left a, an imprint. The first question that we should ask is, what is it I'm trying to do? What is my rational purpose? And quite often I find when we're dealing with a project, I have to step back and say, why am, are we doing this? What is our purpose? And if the answer is, we did it last year, well, that's not good enough. We don't want to be an automatic pilot, just always doing the same thing. So why are we doing this? What do we hope to achieve? Or another way I like to put it to myself, if this project is successful, in what way will the world be different? that we will know we were successful. Not merely we had a lot of activity, but something changed that was worth doing it. And then we want to ask the second question, sorry, the economist question about the most effective means. And here I have Epictetus and Lionel Robbins, two important figures in this regard. What is the least expensive way to do this? Or what is the opportunity cost? What do we give up if we're going to do this? So the other question I'll ask my colleagues when we discuss something, okay, you want to do this? What would you give up to do this? What would you not do in order to undertake this project? So we can focus, are we adding value or just shifting it around? We always want to add value with our activities. Now, we might want to think about, oh, we're nonprofits. Uh, I, by the way, I hate the term nonprofit. I hate the nonprofit sector and I hate the mentality of the NGO. These are all nons, but they don't tell us what we do. To say we're a nonprofit says we're a non entity. What is it that we do? We want to add value with our activity. So the first question is do we have customers? For profit businesses have customers. Do we have customers? Does ALT have customers? Nauman Foundation, Central Asian Free Market Institute, all the organizations here uh, that are involved. We think about customers in a lot of different ways. So my first question is, what is a customer? Well, let's think about that for a moment in terms of our uh, customer base. Who are your customers? Who are the people you are satisfying? People who buy your product, so that's fairly easy. ALT has some customers. Go to the website, buy the book. We understand that model of being a customer. Uh, what about people who buy your books or papers? Uh, people who give you money. Are your donors customers? Or one way to put it is, do you want to keep your donors happy? Uh, so are donors customers? Uh, people who attend your meetings, are they to be considered customers? Well, to cut to the uh, chase, here's how my definition of a customer. Anyone who expends a scarce resource to consume your product is a customer. Don't think only someone who pays money. That's only one kind of customer. There are many kinds of customers. So we can think about the donors. Obviously there's money there. They're customers. They're expending the scarce money that they earned or that they saved. Uh, newspaper page editors. Someone's going to run an article by one of your scholars. Think of the editor in spending space. They have so many uh, uh, inches or square inches on their newspaper page. They're spending that. They could do something else with it. They could run a socialist article. 
how will you convince them to spend that scarce resource of space on your article? Students who attend your meetings or even visit your webpage. The Americans have that expression, time is money. They're spending their time, and that is one thing that is certainly scarce. You never have enough time. So if someone comes to your meeting, they're spending time to do that. Let's think about a politician or a political assistant who carries your program in. They have political capital that they're going to spend to advance this agenda. What would induce them to do that? What would get the person to do that? Why should they? And if you just say, well, because it's true, just, and good, trust me, that's not enough for most politicians. <laughs> they want something else. It will make them more famous, it will advance their career. Something of value will be obtained by them in the course of doing that. So what do the customers get in exchange for their scarce resources? Their time, their money, their attention, or their political capital? Well, politicians uh, get credit if the policy is successful. Right? They're known as wise people who help their country, they get reelected, and so on. They get some benefit from it in exchange for it. Donors, what do donors get? Well, one thing that's very important that we often forget, donors achieve an identity. I'm the kind of person who believes in the future of my country. I'm the kind of person who wants to have a better society. When I go to events for Cato Institute, I meet people all over North America who say I'm a member of the Cato Institute because they donate $100 a year. There are about 20,000 people who do that. Well, they're achieving an identity. That's the kind of person who I am. We do that in lots of ways. The clothes we wear, the circles we travel in, and so on. And one of them is to achieve an identity. Uh, students. Well, they can get resources to write better papers, to be better researched, and so on, to be advanced in school, maybe to get into a graduate program. A journalist, what do journalists get from you? Easy quotes. They can call up Ali Salman, and they say, okay, I got an interesting quote. And mostly journalists like to say, on the one hand, on the other hand. You're on the one hand. You're providing a service to them. And you do research for them, you give them numbers. Journalists love numbers to put into articles. So you're helping them to make better articles. And of course, all of us involved in this achieve our personal identities, being the people that we want to be, people who stand up for justice and uh, 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 good policies. Now, businesses also have competitors. So who are your competitors? We're going to think about this business approach. Well. Is it only other ideological organizations or organizations with moral or political agendas? So we think the socialists, the nationalists, the fascists, and so on. Well, those are, of course, competitors, but they're not the only competitors. They're not the only people with whom you are competing. You can think about all the other competitors for the time and attention and funds and resources of your members, supporters, and participants. Academic clubs, the cinema, that's a competitor. The student can go to the cinema or the student can come to your meeting. So you're competing with the cinema. Study, romance, that's a competitor, takes up a lot of time. Uh, family, work, business, your mosque, your church, your temple, all of these are competitors. So competition need not be hostile. These are not your enemies. Don't think competition is only your enemy, the one you disagree with. It's also the one sometimes you agree with. Your best friends can be friendly competitors. They're competing for the attention and the resources that you are trying to attract. So you want to ask, what will induce them to do that? What can you offer that can compete with your competitors? Well, here's just a couple of suggestions. You can offer equal or better opportunities for social networking, moral advancement, academic advancement, entertainment, fun, we should never forget fun. Fun is important in human life, and you want your activities to be fun. If they're boring, people don't come back. Career advancing, all the other things, and again, I've mentioned romance. We should not forget romance. <laughs> romance is very important. And people often, I know so many people say, I met my husband, my wife, boyfriend, girlfriend at this event. 
People are always thinking about this. It's in the back of their minds. So think about social networking. Romance is another activity that will attract people to your uh, events. Now, if we want to uh, add value, we want to ask, what is it that is involved here? Businesses make profits. Everybody knows that. What do we make? Well, we're non-profit. We don't make profit in that sense. But we are value addicts. We want in every step of everything we do to ask, are we adding value or subtracting value? If you wasted the money, you subtracted value. You threw it away. So we want, we're going to do that sometimes. It's trial and error. We want to focus on adding value. The nonprofit status, which I mentioned I dislike so much, it is a feature of the tax code. It should not drive our activity. The tax policy should not be what drives our moral purpose, but rather what we want to accomplish, and that is adding value and promoting liberty. A couple of other uh, bits of value analysis. You want to say, uh, how do you advance your mission? So the first question, what is your purpose? What do you hope to achieve? What is going to come about? What value are you adding? And this sometimes will allow you to say, you know, I'll talk about this one. Someone else does this better. Let's let them focus on that. We don't add very much value uh, in this field. Uh, what are your comparative advantages if you're working with other people? Or as they say, what do you bring to the table if you're going to have a partnership with a uh, university, another organization, a club? Uh, what is it that you bring to the table? What will you not undertake? Should you make or buy? Quite often they think, well, we should be making this. Well, sometimes it's cheaper to buy it if someone else produces it. Fundamental question uh, from business. And I'm going to wrap up here in a moment with a few other. One quick example, marketing. I want to market a toaster. Now, we want to think about this wonderful product in front of us. It's a classic liberal toaster. <laughs> And the producers normally think about the features. It has a titanium frame, dual core Intel chip controller, and so on. But customers don't care. Ask the engineer, he'll tell you the features. This is why engineers are bad marketers. We are all engineers. We should ask, what are the benefits? And translate every feature into a benefit. The simple example, when we do a program, I say, describe the program and make a list. I say, for every item on the list, translate it into a benefit. Titanium frame, no one cares. It won't rust. Customers care about that, right? Uh, it's engineered in the top labs. No one cares. They want to know it will not break. In each case, make a list of the features of your product, then make a list of your benefits that it generates. So now let's think about branding our product. And here we have our toaster, very special branded toaster. We want to brand. And think about what do your customers think of when they're going to buy our product. And here we have a list of possible things. And you can't be all of that. That's something you should be aware of. Think about creating and reinforcing a brand for your product. So people see it, they know what they're getting, they know it's a brand of quality. Our organizations also carry brands. And I'll just conclude with this. Some uh, brands is the reason why businesses spend so much money on branding their organizations. We should think about branding our product as well. Liberalism as the product we're offering to people and our organizations as the vehicles that carry them to this. So, once again, let's go out and be good business people, advance liberty and adding value at every stage. Thank you.